Amen. Amen. So, of course, we're in Matthew chapter 15. I know Sunday I, I preached Matthew 14 and said I needed something else tonight, but I was going to do another Easter theme, but I felt like Sunday morning was pretty Easter theme. And then, of course, on Easter morning, you have to preach the Easter theme message. So, you know, there's only so many Easter theme messages a guy could preach in, in one week. So, I, I figured it wouldn't hurt to just get back into Matthew a little bit. I, I personally like this type of uh, preaching going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, just Amen. because it kind of keeps uh, keeps you preaching on things you might not otherwise think of, and yeah. um, it's just good to, to keep plowing through the book here. So we're, we're going to continue on with that. And of course there in verse 1 it says, Then came to Jesus the scri uh, scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not uh, their hands when they eat bread. So here they come, and notice they say that it's, uh, they, they're accusing him of transgressing the tradition of the elders. So it's not even really something that it's, that it's biblical, it's not even something that God necessarily upholds as a commandment, thou must wash thy hands before thou eatest. You know, there's no such command necessarily. So they're saying right there that it's the tradition of the elders, meaning it's something that they've come up with, it's something that they practice, and that they're accusing Jesus for transgressing this. Like they... You could already get an idea that these Pharisees are more concerned about what they think of things. You know, it's what they're, they're their own authority. They're, it's about what they think, it's about what they believe, it's about what they practice, more than what the Bible actually teaches. You know, and that's kind of a, a great definition for what a Pharisee is. And that's really what, you know, what we might call somebody to, today and say, hey, you're kind of like a Pharisee in this regard. Is when a person puts more emphasis than they should on maybe even on something that's good, and makes it more into a command of it, a commandment than it actually is. And we could think of some examples of this, but and we will here in a little bit. But um, it's interesting how Jesus responds. You know, he, he they come and they accuse him of transgressing the tradition of the elders. And Jesus really doesn't sit here and defend himself necessarily and say, "Well, you know, this is why we do it," and try to explain why it was okay for him to do that. He actually goes on the offense. And, and I think it's a really good lesson. We see that a lot with Jesus, not having to sit there and explain himself to some people. You know, and that's, that's something that we could all kind of learn from is that we don't always have to defend ourselves against every person who wants to criticize us or, or accuse us or be rude to us. You know, we don't always have to go out of our way to make sure to know that they're out of line and that we're right and they're wrong. You know, I was thinking about um, yesterday, I was out soul winning in Ahwatukee, you know, just this, which is this little bit more well-to-do neighborhood south of Phoenix, and the, the soul winning there is rough. I mean, you think you guys, I'm taking you some rough neighborhoods around here, and you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, it's like, I've been out there for, you know, going out there for four months, or excuse me, two months, and we might get one salvation a week out of that place. And it's, wow. it's just, you know, it's, it's hard going. And that's going with a full van load of people. You know, that's going out for an hour with 15 people. It's very well-to-do, very unreceptive. You know, so much so that I'm walking back to the van yesterday, and uh, I'm walking along a sidewalk, you know, I'm not out in the road, and, I'm, and there's a short driveway that goes to a house, maybe 15, 20 feet, and I'm about to walk past this person's driveway when I hear a car horn, just, not like a beep, beep, you know, there's the different types of car horns we're all familiar with, right? You know, when someone's kind of dozing off at the light, we give them the, hopefully you're this guy, we just kind of do the, the, the light two taps just to honk on it, you know, just kind of, hey, it's time to go. You're not the guy who's just like, you know, holding down on the horn, right? You know who you are. <laughs> so it was, it was one of those. It was like, it wasn't that long. But I'm, and I'm in this residential area, and this car, she was going to run me over. You know, what you would do normally is you would stop and let the person walk in front of your driveway and then pull in. Not this lady. She comes whipping in, and I had to stop, and, and she's laying on her horn and, and, and goes in front of me. And then I thought, well, maybe it was just an honest mistake. And I just kept walking. And she gets out of her, and she had some guy with her. She gets out, and she's got the pink hair. And she's all, she looks like she fell into a tackle box. And I, <laughs> I'm walking away, and I'm just like, and she's like, oh, that, I'm surprised that even worked for me. And I don't know if it's because she saw the Bible or whatever. But in the flesh, part of me wanted to turn around and just go around and, and remind her what a jerk she was. And I got in the church van, and I drove by her house, and I thought about... <laughs> But I did, you know, I had somebody with me and I just said, you know, I've got a long, I've got a good streak going. It's been a long time since I've lost my cool out here and freaked out on anybody. I'm not going to let this lady get to me. I'm just going to go down to Thursday and preach about it and get it off my chest from the pulpit and let everybody know what a jerk she was. Her address, no. She's in Ahwatukee, all right, not said. But, but I thought it just kind of came to mind reading this because it's just a good example that Jesus says here is that, 
No, of course, in this example, he goes on the offense, which is not what I did. But that, that he doesn't necessarily have to explain himself or defend himself. And that's kind of what the attitude we should have is, you know, allow people to, you know, if they're going to criticize or, or mock us or, you know, we don't always have to defend ourselves. Now, of course, Jesus here, he goes on the, on the, on the offense and he had good reason to. He's making an example out of these guys. And he's teaching something very important that we can all learn from. He says in verse 3, But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God? So he kind of reminds them, Hey, you know what? You might accuse me of transgressing your tradition, but I'm going to accuse you guys of transgressing the commandment of God. So he steps it up a notch, and he really lays it on him. He says, he says You transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. So the, tra the traditions that they're accusing him of breaking, he's saying, Well, you know what? Some of your guys' traditions are actually contrary to the word of God. And, uh, you know, Mark, in the book of Mark, if you would, turn over to Mark chapter 7, in a parallel passage, we see where Jesus is a little bit more, I don't know if the word abrasive is right, but he's definitely a little bit rougher on the edges with them. And we see a little bit more of the conversation where Jesus really kind of digs it in a little bit more than we see in Matthew. It says in Mark 7, verse 5, And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why uh, walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God. So he's really going after, look at verse 13, he says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So we see in Mark where he kind of really brings it home, and he really kind of lets them have it. Now, it wasn't the act of having a tradition that Jesus is getting after him about, but it's the result of those traditions. It was the manner of those traditions. It was the type of traditions that they had. It wasn't traditions in and of themselves. And we'll talk here in a minute about how the fact that not all traditions are bad, but what was the problem with their traditions? It was that they were laying aside the commandment of God. That they were rejecting the commandment of God. That they were making the word of God of none effect through their traditions, through your traditions. Now we can think of a great modern example of this in the Catholic Church. Yeah. I mean that's a church that is full of traditions that are not, not, that are not good. That are contrary to the word of God. That make the word of God of none effect. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to get a Catholic want to save, uh, get them saved. Get them one to the Lord because they exalt the traditions of the church over the Word of God. That's exactly what they do. I mean, we, you know, my mother in law is a very staunch Catholic, and we've tried to give her the gospel. I know my wife has and others, and she, the problem is, is that she puts more faith in the tr tradition of her church than she does in the Bible. So that's a really good example of that. You know, they teach things that are very contrary. The Bible says, Call no man father upon earth. Yep. And yet, what do they call all these men? They call him father. Yep. And all, many such like things they do. And we can go on and on. That's, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But we see it's that type of thing. That's the problem with having a bad tradition. That's what makes a tradition bad, is when it starts to be contrary to the Word of God. So not all, contra you know, not all traditions are bad, but there are some that are bad. The type that would, like, like Paul warns up in Colossians 2 already, where it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So there are traditions that men have that can spoil us, that are not after Christ, that are after the world, that, that are contrary to the Word of God. Now, not all traditions are bad, of course. In fact, Paul even taught some traditions. He said in 2 Thessalonians 3, he said, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the, the tradition of which we have, which he received of us. So if there's a brother who's walking contrary to the things that Paul has taught in the epistles, and in the context here, it's talking about a person who's not working, being a busybody. And that's the tradition that Paul taught them. He says there in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the, trad the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or epistle. So traditions that were taught by the word of God, by the epistles of God, things that are preached from the word of God, and the traditions that we derive from it that are in accordance with the Word of God, that are not contrary to the Word of God, those are good traditions. Those are things that we could uphold. Now, when our, So when our traditions there are rooted in Scripture, then they're good. The problem with the Pharisees is, is that the traditions were very contrary to Scripture. In fact, they, were, they would even you know, be against Scripture. 
So when, tra you know, when traditions are contrary to Scripture, they need to be done away with. You yeah. know, if we ever find ourselves believing something or practicing something, and somebody takes the Bible and says, hey, what you're believing here is wrong, you know, we need to get that right. We need to get that fixed. You know, especially in this matter of salvation. You know, we're out today, we're knocking on this lady's door, and I ask her, hey, do you know what you got to do to go to heaven? She's always oh, got to, you know, by doing right, living a holy life, something like that. It was works. I mean, that's straight up, that's what she said. From her answer, I'm, you know, I didn't get the impression she was saved. I don't know if you guys did. You know, the, her answer, her response was just like, <clears throat> living a holy life, trying to do right, something like that. You know, and I started, well, can I show you? And I started to go through it with her. You know, and she, and instantly she's just, at one point she just kind of stops the conversation and she's like, how long have you been serving the Lord? And I told her, and she's like, I've been serving the Lord 43 years. Wow. <laughs> and she did and so she said, I've been serving the Lord 43 years. Yeah. What? <laughs> and I didn't say anything. She just kind of lets it, she doesn't, you know, she pause, dramatic effect, yeah. that really settle in with me. Yeah. And I'm not impressed. I'm like, 43 years wasted, you're not even, you don't even understand the gospel. Yeah. You know, and she had so much pride, she couldn't even deal with the fact that somebody was there showing her something contrary to what she believed. Yeah. That someone was taking the Word of God and saying, what you believe is wrong. Yeah. And I, you know, and then she kind of backpedaled at the end, and she, I'm like, so you believe it's all by, I even asked her, I said, so you believe it's by grace, it's a free gift? And she said, no. And I'm like, so you believe it's by works? And then she kind of dawned on what she had said, and she's like, no, no, I mean the, you know, and she tried to explain it. But she'd already said several times, like, you know, and then she got into this whole James 2 thing, and I was out of there. I was done. You know, I quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not by grace. It's by yep. faith. You know, God bless you. Have a nice day. And I left. You know, I wasn't rude to her. But um, I don't know what the point of that was. Oh, yeah. That, she, that when we have a belief that's contrary to Scripture and someone shows us, you know, that what we believe is wrong, we need to change that. I don't care if you've been serving the Lord 43 years or not. Yep. If Amen. what you believe is wrong, you know, like Pastor Anderson always liked to remind people, the book's older than all of us. Yeah. So I don't, I don't care, you know, if even a child comes to you. And says, hey, you know, and I don't think a child would do this, but it doesn't matter who it is, who you're getting it from, if it's from the book. Right. We should be willing to change. So when traditions are contrary to Scripture, they need to be done away with. Look there in verse 4 where it says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. So now Jesus gets specific. He's going to start, like, you know, he tells them, Your traditions are wrong. Let me, let me point out an example. He says, for, the, uh, the, for God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. <clears throat> and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and mother, it is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and mother, he shall be free. So he's saying, and then he goes on and says, Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So that's a bad tradition. When you take something and say, yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but, you know, here's what we believe. I know that's kind of what the Bible teaches, but here's how we actually do it. You know, you're making the word of God of none effect by your tradition. And it needs to be done away with. And specifically what he's talking about here, you know, is honoring thy father and thy mother. And if you were to go over to, uh, don't turn there, but in the, in the uh, parallel passage, I believe in Mark, where they say it is a, it is a gift whithersoever thou art profited by me. So basically their tradition was, is that instead of taking, when it says honor thy parents and, and their, uh, honor thy father and mother, he's talking about taking care of them in their old age. Mm -hmm. Not just obeying what they say, not just doing them as a child. But actually, when they get to the place where they can no longer take care of themselves, that we, as their children, as adults, are to honor them, you know, like, like as it says that, that, that the, the, the leaders that rule well are, are worthy of double honor. That's talking about wages. That's talking about taking care of their needs. Mm -hmm. You know, we are to honor our parents by taking care of them, you know, if need be. And this used to be a much more common practice. I remember my mother talking to me and telling me about how when her grandmother came and lived with her, and she really liked it as a child because my mom was actually my, my, grand, my great grandmother's favorite. And she would sneak upstairs to her little apartment they'd made, and my, my uh, great my grandmother would give her candy that she wasn't supposed to have, right? So, kids, there's some real benefits of this for you. you know? <laughs> if I'm ever there, I want the grand, I wish I had grandkids that I could implore now and be like, hey, remember, if grandpa ever comes, you know, you can get me in there, my, this would be candy in for you. But I don't have any of them yet. So. But this used to be a much more common practice where, where adult children would take care. Now, what do we do today? Now we just ship them off into you know, a nursing facility. And I understand sometimes you know, when it gets to the point where they have extreme physical needs, like they're not able to, you know, they're, they're, they're nearing the end of their life, and maybe there's a time where they need professional medical help. But I don't think just, you know, and, and, and the problem is, too, that even the elderly, they even have the attitude, well, I don't want to be a burden to my children. Yeah. 
Well, I, that's great that you feel that way, I guess. You know, no matter, regardless of how you feel about it, the Bible says that we are to honor our, our mother and our, and, their, and our father. So we should definitely be willing to do that if called upon, and it should be something that is expected. But they did not do that. And they would say, well, you know, it's kind of like an inheritance. You know, you're going to give me an inheritance by not being a financial burden to me in your old age. It is a gift, whithersoever thou art profitest by me. That's what they're saying. Instead of me having to take care of you and spend money on you and feed you and clothe you and shelter you in your old age, we'll just mark it up as a gift towards me, that you're just being generous towards me. It's a type of inheritance. And that is their tradition, and that tradition is contrary to the Word of God. In fact, he said they made the Word of God of none effect by that tradition. So, how do we apply it to ourselves today? Well, you know, we should be very careful about teaching our preferences as commandments. That's really where this comes into. You know, we might say, there might be something in the Word of God, and we might say, you know, I know that's what it teaches, but I have this preference or something like that. And that's one way. But another way is to, sit, is to get up here and say, well, I have a preference that the Bible's not really clear about, but I'm going to teach it like it's Scripture. And there, there's, uh, you know, in recent, you know, history in our, you know, in our own type of churches and things like that, there have been certain things that have been taught from other pulpits and other churches that have been kind of an issue. And one of them would be, for example, breastfeeding. You know, there's a big, some people have a real problem with a woman, you know, openly breastfeeding in, in a public space like a church. And they say, you shouldn't do it. They'll go to such great lengths to say, you know, go to this back room and sit there in this closed off room and, you know, and, and feed your child under a hot blanket on a hot, sweaty day. You know, and, and that's not anything you're going to find. And they'll go to great lengths and preach really odd sermons trying to back this up. Uh -huh. You know, right. about how that's nakedness, and the Bible does not describe that as nakedness. And then, the, and a lot of times, the, you know, they'll, they'll go to great lengths by painting pe people who, who practice open breastfeeding as if they're like, you know, just, just lewd, topless women, right? I'm like, they'll say things like, you know, women shouldn't be topless in church. Well, of course not. Nobody's yeah. teaching that. <laughs> that. That's quite the leap to say going from a woman who's going to modestly and discreetly nurse her child as nature intended to right. all of a yeah. sudden they're topless. Yeah. And it, they're, it's such a stupid statement and such a stupid way to think because, hello, bozo, you know, it only takes one breast to feed a child. Right. You know, you, one at a time is all you need to, to show. You don't even really have to show anything. Right. You know, and I don't want to, that's really something that could probably be its own sermon, but I'm never going to get up here and pre and say that you must, op you know, practice open breastfeeding in this church or you're not welcome here. <laughs> because that's a preference that people have. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you feel that you need to go out in the parking lot and sit in the car and make sure nobody's around and get a, you know, kebab, or what do they call it? Not a kebab. Hijab. 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 Kebab. <laughs> you can tell I'm hungry. Yeah. Right? You get the hijab on. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to do that, that's fine. That's your preference. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to think it's kind of silly. I'm going to, you know, but if that's how you feel about it, you want to be more discreet than somebody else, fine. Yeah. But don't go to somebody and say, hey, you know, you, should, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be openly breastfeeding. You know, and of course we want to be discreet. We want to use, you know, delicacy in this matter. And we don't want to you know, offend people with it. And, and I know ladies that are very, very open about breastfeeding. That in certain situations they will cover up for the sake of others because they don't want to offend other people. And that's fine. Because it's, it's a preference. It's, it's however you feel about it. But, you know, we're not going to be the type of church that says... You can't do it. You yeah. cannot openly breastfeed in this church. Yeah. You must go to the back room and you must make sure nobody sees you. And if somebody sees you, you know, because, you know, and it just makes me want to go off on the whole thing because it's, it's just crazy. Like, where are your minds at if this is a problem for you? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and let me just be a little blunt here. Like, if you as a man are attracted to a lactating breast, <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, I've, my wife has four kids. Right. She's breastfed all of them. You know, it, you know, to me, to be blunt, it doesn't do it for me. That's right. You know, it's just not, you know. And they'll say, well, breasts are sensual. Of course they are. We are not stupid. But you'll notice whenever the Bible talks about breasts in a sensual manner, it's plural. Yeah. It talks about it as both of them and not just as one. So, you know, again, uh, do with that what you will. But that's just another, that's just an example where people can go off yeah. and have a preference and teach it as a doctrine. And say, and it becomes like a doctrine of their church. They'll say it's a commandment of God. That if you do it, you're naked, you're in sin. That's a commandment that you're teaching, which is actually a preference, which is a tradition that you're teaching as a commandment of God. So we have to be careful about not letting our preferences become 
own doctrines of men that would that would you know be contrary to the word of God. What's another area? Well, I think another one is dating principles, where you start to have kids that are going you know teenagers are getting to the place where they're thinking about finding a spouse and how they're going to go about that process. There's there's camps of people. They write whole books. I mean, they have seminars, you know, a whole three part series of preach about how to go through the process of courtship and. They have all these rules about whether what a teenager should and should be allowed to do, but you know what? That's all your preference. That's all your idea. Yep. I mean, where where in the Bible does it what, does it what what exactly does the Bible say about it's that? Not there. It's not there. It's not there. I mean, there's certain principles that we can take from it. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, you know, and it's good to avoid the mere appearance of evil. Do I believe teenagers should be left alone? You know, unsupervised. No, but again, that's my preference. Then I get that from the Word of God. I get that as a preference that I, I'm not going to get up and say that if you do that, you're in sin. I will say you're probably leaving a door open to potential sin. You know, we should be careful about in this matter. We shouldn't be just loose cannons when it comes to dating principles. But it's one of these areas where people they take a lot of liberties and they start to teach, they'll say things like, "Well, you know, they'll." I've even heard people say that teenagers shouldn't even be allowed to text each other unsupervised. Or have a phone conversation unsupervised. Now, how do you do that? How do you have? I've literally heard people say this in churches like this, where they'll say teenagers should not be allowed to have conversations on the phone unsupervised. Now, how do you do that besides putting on speakerphone or being on the other line, listening to every word that's said? How would you at, now put yourself in the position of a young adult who's trying to find a spouse, trying to get to know somebody, and talk? You know a little bit more plainly about things, about life, you know. I mean, I mean, of course, that's a stage that they get to if this relationship is getting serious. At some point, you have to talk about some pretty, you know, adult things, serious things about child rearing, what you believe in, that stuff like that. How are you supposed to be open with that person that you're thinking about marrying if you know mom's on the other, just listening to every word you your mouth and judging everything that you say? Now, if that's you and you want, that's how you want to have your children date, by all means, go ahead. That's your preference, though. Yeah. You can't come to another parent and say, this is how your child should be dating this yeah. so-and-so. And, you know, if you do, let me just say, you're way out of line. And people need to just mind their own business and worry about themselves and worry about, you know, their own children. So, again, I don't want to spend a light on these things, but these are just a couple examples that we can see in certain areas. And, you know, if we probably went around the room, we could think of other ones. We could think of other areas in life where people allow their preferences to become doctrines of men that they would exalt them and put them you know on par with scripture but you know teaching uh, commandments as preferences is equally simple of taking a commandment of a sure thing in the word of God that is taught that is clear a clear commandment and saying well that's just a preference you know for example dress standards you know, the Bible's real clear that, that a man shall not put on that which pertaineth unto a woman and a woman should not put on that which pertaineth unto a man well, what Paul really meant, and they'll have a way, a cute way of explaining that away, but the Bible's real clear about that, that we should be dressed a certain way. Or church attendance. You know, okay, we were not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And some people will say, if you're not in church three times a week, you're in sin. Well, I, I personally, my, pref my preference in that, or my prefer preference is that everybody's in church every time the doors are open. But I'm not going to go so far to say that if you're not here every single service that you're in sin. You know, if you're here once a week, you know, if you're doing everything you can to make it, people get busy sometimes, I get it. If we're in the habit of not coming to church, then yeah, we should probably examine our hearts and our, and our lives and, and our priorities. Yeah. But, you know, if we're doing what we can and we're getting to church, and I'm not going to say that if you're not here more than, you know, once a week, that you're in sin. That would be me saying, you know, making a preference out of it. Uh, you know, other areas. I want to move on though because there's so much more in this chapter, and we're kind of, kind of starting to uh, go on a bit of a bird walk here. But verse seven it says, "Ye hypocrites, uh, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me." And isn't that the perfect definition of a hypocrite? That they say and do not. You know, they say one thing, but in their heart it's far from them. They don't do the things that they say. He says, "But in vain they do worship me." Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It's in vain. You know, people who want to preach their preferences and have a very holier than thou attitude, or have some standard that's um, you know some extra biblical standard that they exalt, and, and it, you know, and they're saying, well, it's because I'm so holy. It's really, well, it's actually in vain. You know, in vain they do worship him. It's it's really just to lift up themselves. 
And he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand. So, you know, Jesus is making, this is kind of why we see he goes on the offense. Because he calls the multitude and says, Hear and understand. You know, he takes the time to rebuke these guys and make an example out of them because he wants the multitude to understand. That's why we have it here. We need to look at the story and understand why it is that, that Jesus took the time to rebuke these Pharisees. And so that we don't fall in the same trap of, of teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. He goes on and says, Not that which goes out uh, into the mouth defile of the man. Because remember, what was their contention in the very beginning? That they were eating with unwashing hands. And he's saying, look, their tradition's wrong. Here's why. Because not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the man, this defileth the man. Now, don't get carried away with this and think that you should just never wash your hands. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of washing in the Old Testament. There's a lot of, the Bible is a very hygienic book. It teaches a lot of cleanliness, of taking baths, and of using running water, and cleaning yourselves, and, being, and days of purification. So, what Jesus isn't saying here is like you just never. You know, it's okay to just be a dirty slob. You know, it's probably still a good idea to wash your hands before you. You know, if you think about it. That's right. You know, I, 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 whenever I in Phoenix, I have to count the offering. Uh, if I if I have handle money, I'm oh I'm, I leave the office, I instantly go and wash my hands before I even sit down, because I'll forget. And if I go home and I have dinner after church after handling dirty money, you ever notice how cash money just has a stench to it? Yeah. You ever had a, a lot of money stacked out that you're counting? <clears throat> it literally smells. It's it's uh, it's nasty. Think of all the people that have touched it. Who knows what they were doing? Where it's been? Yep. You know, it's been in some bar. Yep. Who knows what kind of bar? That money's been <laughs> circulated through you know hundreds of people's hands. But people will, will handle that stuff, and then they'll just go and they'll you'll see them after service just. <laughs> you know, like, get a bag, and I'm just like, dude, I hope you wash your hands, man. So don't don't think that just because Jesus you know rebuked them for washing that it's okay to just never wash. It's probably still a good, good idea. But the problem was is that they were rebuking Jesus for having for them not doing it. You know, and don't don't go to the other extreme where it's like, you know, every time you before you touch anything, you're you're one of those people that just has, you know, the sanitizer bottle with you on, on hand at all times. It's just like on a, a necklace <laughs> hanging on a chain. Just, you know, every time you touch anything, you have to sanitize yourself. It's good to be exposed to some germs a little bit to help build up your immune system. Yeah. You know, there have been times where I've I've you know I, my nails are dirty, my hands have gotten grit in them. If, if, you know, if you're a man that works with your hands, you know, sometimes you got to get that lunch on the road. If you're driving down the road, you know, if you work in the service van, I know guys in here do. I did for a long time. You know, you got you leave the job, you got to get to the next one. There's no time to pull over and, and make sure the water's the right temperature, and you got a good lather. <laughs> you spend two minutes and, and making sure every nook and cranny. You know, you got a little grit, you got a little grease, you got a little dirt. Yep. You know, but you got to get that sandwich down. So. There's nothing wrong with that either. But he's just trying to make the point here that it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles you. It's actually what comes out of the mouth which defileth the man, as he says there in verse 11. And, you know, on this point too, it's like, we don't want to be a Pharisee in a lot of areas, and I think one area that we can kind of do that is about food. And, and sometimes we can, you know, I'm all for eating organic, and we should strive to do that just because our bodies are the temple. We should try and do that. But don't turn into the, like one of these snobby people that will refuse to eat that you know if someone pats you over for dinner invites you over and you're gonna be like where did this beef come from <laughs> is this hormone free you know is this grass-fed non no antibiotics and things like that you know we we should just be grateful that someone wants to feed us Man. and, and eat right. what's put before us thinking nothing of it and just maybe you just need to pray extra hard over that you know and just ask god <laughs> to uh sanctify with the word of god in prayer but we don't want to become a Pharisee about that either. You know, that's one of those areas. This kind of reminded me of that because he's talking about eating and his hands and everything. And sometimes we can get carried away with that. So let's be on guard about that. But he goes on and says in verse 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? <laughs> I love that. And Jesus' response. And he said, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father planted, hath not planted, shall be rooted up. So Jesus doesn't apologize. He's like, Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't realize. You think I should go apologize to these guys? And, you, know, I didn't, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. You know, I was a little abrasive. He doesn't make any apology. Right. He says, look, you know, if they're not of my Heavenly Father, they're going to be rooted up. Yeah, they're going to be torn up and cast away. They're going to be replaced. Yeah. You know, he understands who these guys were, what they were about. They're false prophets. You know, they're, they're, they bind heavy burdens and they wouldn't lift with one of their fingers. That they take away the key of knowledge and that those that were entering into the kingdom of heaven, they prevent it. These were wicked men, and Jesus didn't make any apology for preaching hard and offending wicked people, and neither should we. 
You know, we shouldn't sit there and feel and, and lose any sleep when a, when the you know some sodomite or some whoever gets offended by the preaching of the word of God. If it condemns them as wicked, that's what they are. Yep. You know, and we shouldn't uh, apologize. Jesus certainly did it, and you know what? I'm not going to either. You know, somebody comes to me, hey, you know what, pastor preacher is really offensive. Well, was it true? Well, then tough. You know, deal with it. You yeah. know. Uh, we're living in a society that's becoming increasingly over, you know, hypersensitive to every little thing that's said. Yeah. To the point now where, like, I, I, I talked to uh, Pastor Aaron Thompson once oh, a little while back on the phone where he was telling me about how you hear about these things like, uh, you know, these uh, feminists who, who, are, who are to the point now where even if a man were to hold open a door for him, yeah. they'll be like, you don't need to do that for me. Yeah. Who, who do you think I am? I'm not strong enough to hold open my own door. And they'd get offended over the fact that a man would even take the time uh, to hold open a door for a complete stranger. That's right. Yeah. That and he's told me he's seen it happen up there in Portland. I, you know, Portland's that hotbed of just. <laughs> oh, yeah. there, when your motto of your city is "Keep Portland Weird," there's gonna be some weird stuff. Yeah. Going on, all right. I'm just saying. That's no. It's no shock that 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 type of thing goes on there. But that's where we're at in this country. Yeah. With a bunch of these, you know, the millennial generation, everything like that, all the stuff that's been taught to them and crammed down their throat. Um, and now they're trying to cram it down ours with this whole thing. You can't even hold open a door for somebody without them getting offended. Yeah. So, you know, we should keep that in mind that Jesus, you know, he he didn't mind offending people. You know, if that's the word, if that's what the, you know, the, the, the way the, the word of God slices, then, you know, and it cuts, then so be it. Amen. He says, verse 14, let them, let them alone. Let them be offended. Let them go off and boo boo about it. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto, this par uh, unto us this parable. So Peter's trying to get some understanding, and Jesus kind of rebukes him a little bit. He says, And he said, Are ye also yet without understanding? So Peter doesn't seem to understand that, that parable about that which cometh out of a man is what defiled him. He needs that, and Jesus is kind of, it seems like Jesus, is, of course, isn't surprised or shocked, but he takes the time to at least say to Peter, don't, don't you get it yet, Peter? So he kind of rebukes him a little bit there, and uh, what that kind of, you know, should be a lesson to us is that when we lack understanding, when there's things that we don't understand, it kind of lands us in the wrong crowd, potentially. You know, we kind of, he's kind of lumped up with the Pharisees right here, because they didn't get it either, they were just offended. <laughs> and, and Peter comes along and says, "You know, declare this unto me as well." And he, and he says, "Are don't you under? Are you also without understanding? Saying, aren't you? Are you like them? Are you like these Pharisees who can't understand Peter?" Yeah. So when we have a lack of understanding. You know, we should be careful about that, especially about vocalizing it, because people might perceive us as being kind of with the wrong crowd. We should be careful about, you know, what we say. If there's something we understand, you know, we should seek counsel. We should study for ourselves. We should try to understand it. Um, and ask the Lord to give us understanding. He goes on in verse 7, 17 and says, Do ye not yet understand? Uh, do ye not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth and goeth into the belly, and is caught, cast out into the draft? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So what this is saying here, you know, what we can take from this is the importance of our thought life. The things that are in our heart. He says these things come out of our heart. Now, of course, we know he's not talking about the literal organ that's beating in our chest. But he's talking about, when it talks about the heart, it's talking about the seat of your emotions, your inner man, what you're thinking, how you feel about things. It's out of your heart, the, your heart and soul. You, you, you hear that, that phrase used a lot. So it's the things that are thinking, the things that are, a man, you know, every, every sin starts in the mind. There all of these sins that he lists here, they, he starts out, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, right? And that's where it starts, is with your evil thoughts. And then they manifest themselves as murders, adulteries, fornications. They, we allow the things that we think of to play out in our flesh. And that's where these things, uh, you know, that's where these real wicked sins come from. But where do they start? They start within, they start within the heart, they start in the mind, the thoughts. So it's important that we have a right thought life. You know, that we should be careful about what the things that we're thinking of. We should be careful about the things that we let enter into our mind. Yeah. You know, we should be careful about the things that we take in and what we digest. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, and, and uh, it's something we have to be on guard about. And, and we think, you know, and you know, I've been guilty about of this as well, you know, thinking that, you know, I know the Bible, I know the truth, it's okay if I kind of dabble in this area, 
You know, it's not going to affect me. You know, I can, I can watch this. I can listen to this guy. You know, because I know the truth. I know what's right. It's not going to affect me. But if we're not careful, yeah. you know, a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. It can creep in. And it can. It has the potential to grow up and affect the way we think about things. Yeah. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, where as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, the, in talking about, you know, in a, a, in a certain context, but it's a, it's a principle that's true. That as we think in our hearts, so, so we are. You know, the things that we think about, the things that we uh, let, allow our minds to rest on, that's how we're going to act out. I mean, we think about our attitudes. You know, if we have wake up in the morning, we have a bad attitude, we're not going to go around smiling. We're not going to go around saying good morning or greeting or being polite to people. If we're in a bad attitude, if our heart isn't right, then, then we're going to act out accordingly. You know, when we act right, when are we going to act right? When we're thinking right, when our thoughts are right. <clears throat> the Bible says to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And we'll think right, we'll do, we'll do right when we think right, and we'll think right when we let the Word of God do our thinking for us. You know, we got to let the Word of God form our thoughts. Yeah. And if you would, just quickly turn over to Romans chapter 12. This is something that the Bible talks about, as allowing God to renew our minds, and letting God um, you know, do our thinking for us, teaching us how we ought to think about things. And it says here in Ephesians 4, it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It says where you're at in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a, a wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the ruin, renewing of your mind. They may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's saying we need to be renewed and a, 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 a transformed by the renewing of our mind. You know, the first commandment there is to, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. You know, that we are not our own, and that we should live holily and unbl unblameably in this present and evil world, that there are things that we should, a manner of living that we have to actually physically live in this life. But let me tell you something, you're never going to present your body a living sacrifice unto God if you're not transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because as you think in your heart, so you are. So if your thought life isn't right, you know, if, you're, if your thoughts are different than the, the things that you ought to be thinking about, there's no way you're going to present your body. You're going to go so far as to act it out physically. It's the things that, because it's, again, what comes, it's the things that come out of a man that defile him or that help him, you know, present his body a living sacrifice. So we have to be careful about the things that we think about, that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And really what this comes down to is just letting the Bible tell us how to think about things. Yeah. And people, they get all up in arms about that and they even level criticisms at people like that. For, for doing this. They say, oh, you let the Bible do all your thinking for you. Well, amen. Yeah. I mean, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are far above my ways. Uh, you know, I'm going to let him do my thinking for me. I mean, I'm going to let God, you know, renew my, you know, wash, uh, wash my mind with the, with the water of the word. I'm going to let him renew my mind and tell me how to think about things because a natural man doesn't, you know, he doesn't think the way God thinks. That's right. He's contrary to the word of God. That's right. And, uh, you know, I, was, I don't know if anyone here listened to that Irish radio interview that Pastor did this last yeah. week. <laughs> and he admonished those that haven't heard it last night to not listen to it, you know, because the guy gets, one of the guy's last callers who starts using cuss words. And it's, it was just kind of frustrating. I don't know how he does it. Gets on there and talks to those people and just listen to them just pour out their ignorance. But one of the criticisms this guy had, it was like, oh, you know, oh, you just let the Bible do all your thinking for you. The pastor's like, yeah. He's like, well, I'm going to raise my kids to be independent thinkers. Well, get, no, you're not. There's no such thing. Yeah. This is what Pastor said in the interview. I was like, you know, he's right. There, are, there is no such thing as an independent thinker. Because what do you mean by that? You're, you're saying, well, I'm going, to do all, I'm going to do all my thinking for myself. You are, you are letting somebody. I don't care who you are. You, 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 no one's coming up with stuff on their own. They're all getting it from somewhere else. Yeah. They're allowing either you're either being influenced by the world or you're being influenced by God. That's right. Those are your two options. Either the, the God of this present world or the God of heaven. One of them is influencing your thinking. There is no independent thinker who just has every, every thought's original with him. He doesn't take any input from anybody else. I mean, you wouldn't even know how to think at all to begin with. You know, like, well, I'm not going to do arithmetic the way they taught me because I'm an independent thinker. I'll, I'll find another way to find out the sum of these apples, yeah. you know, other than, math, other than mathematics. You know, because I'm an independent thinker. Right. You know, I'm not going to rely on somebody else's formula of 1 plus 2 equals 3. 
because I'm just so intellectually superior. And that's what these people who talk like that, they just want to come off of these, you know, uh, just these, these fake intellectuals who think they're smarter than they really are, and they just like to spout off of the mouth. You know, I don't have any problem with saying that I let God do my thinking for me. Amen. That, you know, I let my mind line up with the book and let Him tell me how I have to think about things and let Him form my opinions. Amen. And I don't care if that bothers other people. And if the things that I get out of the Word of God that I learn, that I think, and my opinions that are in, in line with the Word of God, if it offends other people, so be it. I don't care if they like it. They can like it or lump it. Amen. So there really are no independent thinkers, and we shouldn't set out to be. Now, I'm not saying that we should never use critical thinking and think things through. But, I mean, we all, at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, do, does what I think about the subject line up with Scripture? Yeah. Is my opinion... Is it contrary to the Word of God or not? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move on here where it says in verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she, said, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now, someone was recently asking about this, and I really didn't have an exact answer. So I thought about this passage, and, and I think I kind of understand, you know, why does Jesus seem so cold to this woman? I mean, you got to admit, he, he's pretty cold here. At least it seems that way. It's kind of a curt response. It's not exactly... I mean, there were other people that came to him that Jesus was like, you know, he was ready to go to their house, to the, to the house and heal the son, oh. to raise uh, the daughter from the dead. We see other instances where Jesus is very quick to help people. But in this one, he's almost kind of callous. It seems like. And he's very, he seems like he has kind of a colder response. I mean, no doubt about it, he, he makes the analogy of casting, you know, the children's meat to dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's kind of basically kind of in a backhanded way calling her... A dog, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's kind of a, an insult. So why is it? Why does Jesus take the time to do this? And I thought about this, and, you know, maybe this is right or wrong. I don't know. This is kind of just my opinion of why. But I think that it was for the sake of those that were with him, specifically his disciples. Because if we look at this passage, his disciples, they kind of have this haughty attitude a little bit about who they are. Mm -hmm. See, now we have to understand something in the beginning of the story is that Jesus already knows how this is going to end. He already knows whether or not this woman is going to receive what he says or not. Yeah. Yeah, and he, I think he's kind of using this opportunity to teach his disciples a lesson in humility and a lesson about who God's people are. Uh, notice their own coldness in verse 23. We say, oh, Jesus is kind of cold. Well, his disciples were too. If you look at verse 23, it says, His disciples came to him and besought him, saying, send her away. You know, they didn't come and say, hey, Jesus, it sounds like this, this lady really needs something. Would you, would you help her, Lord? Would you, would you come to this lady and see what it is she needs? It's like, send her away. They're, and it says that they besought him. Yeah. They're begging him. They're like, will you please get this? You know, it's like when you have the noisy kid, honey, will you take that kid in the other room? What's going on? What do we need to do? You know, they're, they're, they're annoyed. They're bothered by this woman. So they, they kind of already called themselves. And I think Jesus kind of takes this opportunity to point it out to them. And also teach him another lesson. So they besought him, they, 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 they begged him, and notice they kind of have this elitist mentality. He says, they say that the disciples came unto him and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Now, was she crying after them? No. She was crying after, she was saying, You know, Jesus, O Lord, thou yeah. son of David. Yeah. She, she's talking to him. Yeah. You know, she's not going, Oh, the disciples. You know, come, come, you know, beseech the Lord on my behalf. Yep. But what's their attitude? Yep. They, she crieth after us, Lord. <laughs> this is kind of elitist, better than her mentality. And this was something that was really prevalent in that day because we have to remember here that this is a woman out of the coast of Canaan. This is not a Jew. This is a woman that, you know, was would be considered a heathen or a Gentile. So they kind of had this had this mentality, this, this philosophy of looking down on other people that were like them. And, you know, and, it, and it really it stems from the, her nationality, a woman of Canaan. <clears throat> but, and that's contrary to the Word of God, to have that kind of an attitude. You know, I don't care what color you are. If, you, if you're like, well, I'm this color, and, and if you're not my color, then you, you ain't as good. You know, whatever. You know, everyone, 
is people get this idea they let something as simple as carnal as the skin color become a, a means of that making thinking that they're better than somebody else. And, and that should never be the case. The Bible says in Deuteronomy verse uh, chapter one, you shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You know, and they and they didn't want to hear this this woman. They they were having respect of persons saying, Well, she's not our, our ethnicity, she's not of our nationality. You know, she's nothing. But the Bible says here that you should not respect persons in judgment. You know, they should have said, let's hear her out. Lord, what does she, you know, Lord, will you hear her? The Bible says we shouldn't respect persons. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, to have respect of persons is not good. And, you know, if, you, and if you're allowing skin color to be a determinant whether or not you will accept somebody or reject somebody, you are a respecter of persons. You're respecting that person solely based on you know, skin color, nationality, age, whatever carnal reason that people think up of to, to have some reason to not uh, give somebody the time of day or treat them differently than they otherwise would. <clears throat> and I think Jesus had to break them of this idea of thinking that they were better than other people simply because they were of a certain nationality, that they were of a certain ethnicity, that because she was a woman of Canaan, they didn't have to regard her. Right? He kind of had to break them of this. Why? Because remember what the commandment is at the end. Go and teach all nations. Now how are you going to get these 12 disciples to go and teach all nations if they won't even give it this woman of Canaan the time of day? Yeah. If they're saying, send her away, she crieth after us. If they have this elitist mentality. So I think what's going on here is Jesus comes off cold to show them how cold they were being. I think he comes off with this kind of elitist mentality to show them that they have an elitist mentality. And to show them that it's not right that eventually they're going to complete the mission that God has given to us, and to them, that they have to get over this. And they have to not look down on people and be a respecter of persons. I mean, that'd be real, I mean, wouldn't it be you know, a real shame if we were to go soul winning and say, hey, we're going to such and such place. Oh, that neighborhood's too Hispanic for me. Yeah. Oh, there's too many black people that live there. I'm not going to Awatuki. There's just too many white wealthy people. <laughs> right? They call it all white Tuki for a reason. Right? That's what I call it. <laughs> now it's not all white. There are, I mean, a lot of people of different colors. But wouldn't that be a poor attitude to yeah. have? Yeah. Well, I only, you know, I, I'm a white guy, so I only witness to white people. You know, that's what's going on here. Well, we, well send her away. She's yeah. from Canaan. Yeah. We don't want to talk to her. Well, we have a mission to teach all nations, right. all people, regardless. You know, and Paul understood this. But maybe that's why Paul did some of the greatest works. Maybe it was why that was why Paul was the one who went out and reached the you know the ends of the earth with the gospel of Christ that did more than any of the other disciples, because he was the one that understood as it says in Acts uh, 17. He said uh, that God hath made of one blood all nations. You know you want to trace back. You want to be proud of your lineage and where you come from and you know what your roots are. Well, if we all trace it back far enough, it all comes down to Adam. It all comes down to Noah. It all comes back to one guy. And God hath made all nations of one blood. You know, we're all the same. We're all, we're all, uh, you know, just because we're a different color or different nationality, it shouldn't matter. And uh, in the Bible says in Galatians 3, again, Paul was the one who understood this. That's why he was able to write in Galatians 3, You are all children of God by faith in Jesus and Christ Jesus. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, if we're in Christ, we're all one. It doesn't matter, you know, whether we're Jew, Greek, bond, free, male, female. It doesn't matter what our skin color is. It doesn't matter where we come from. You know, that's why I don't think there should be, you know, the black church, the Asian church. The only time you should have those dividing lines, I think, is if it's a matter of linguistics. Like this is a certain, and this is a Spanish-speaking church. You know, there's some people, their primary language, the only language they speak is Spanish. Then yeah, by all means, go to a Spanish church. Yeah. You know, but it shouldn't be because, you know, that we're Hispanic, so we only go to people, you know, where uh, only Hispanics are. Or we're, we're black, so we only go to where, where there's black people. And is that not the case? I mean, do we not see that? That happens all the time. Yeah. Where, where, where you have what's called a black church. And I'm sure there, there's people there that aren't, I'm not saying they're racist, like they wouldn't let a white person in, but it would be kind of awkward, you know, that they, they, it's, that's how it's known, if this is a black church, you know, it's for black people. And that's not the way it should be in the house of God. And I thank God that, you know, even in this small group, we have a diversity of ethnicities. 
You know, and if you go to Faithful Word, I mean, you'll see people from every nation under heaven practically there. Yeah. I mean, we've got, we got black people, and I'm saying we got black people. I mean, like black, black, <laughs> like dark, yeah. right, from Africa. And we've got people from, you know, Europe that are there. I mean, white, you want to talk about white. You get some Europeans in there, <laughs> right? We've got Hispanic people. We've got Native American people. That's why I love it when I, well, I don't love it. That's why I find it very humorous when I see people criticizing and saying Pastor Anderson's racist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have know, a black guy reading scripture. You know, or yeah. about, you know, they'll be, you know, he's no longer there for other reasons because he was a heretic. But yeah. There was a time, you know. <laughs> and, it, you know, we had, if you were just show up and you'd look around, you would see just a, a very diverse crowd. Why? Because like Paul, we understand that the mission is to all nations. Amen. And that's, you know, that's why I think Jesus kind of did this to this lady. Kind of gave her that cold shoulder at first. It's because of the fact that he had to wake up his disciples and say, listen, just because she's from Canaan doesn't make her any less important. Because <clears throat> the Bible, you know, it does say that God desires all men to be saved. Yeah, amen. All of them. Not just one ethnicity. Yeah. Not just one nationality. He is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. You know, and that goes for the, the Zionists' precious Jews as well. You know, those that would say that the Jews are God's chosen people and that they get a pass and that they don't need to go through Jesus. Well, the Bible says that God is the Savior, Jesus is the Savior of all men. All men. Even the Jew over there. You know, he's not going to get a special pass into heaven if he rejects Jesus Christ just because he, he claims a certain lineage or lives in a certain part of the world. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says in Revelation that... He, they, they, they see the throne and they say that, uh, that God has redeemed us redeemed us out of God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. All of them. That's who's in heaven. Yep. So I think Jesus does that for this reason and he also gives them you know, an, oppor an opportunity to see what real humil humility looks like. I mean, you have to think about this lady. This took some real humility yeah. for her to go there and to be treated in this way and still insist. And not to just get offended, walk away, and, and think, who does he think he is? And, you know, noodle neck him. You know, maybe, <laughs> you know, I don't need you. You know, talk to the hand, the head ain't listening. And get upset, right? So Jesus kind of does that because he wants, I think he wanted them to see what, some, what real humility looks like. <clears throat> not she crieth after us. He says here, um, he, she allowed Jesus to publicly degrade her. Yeah. I mean, in front of these people. He said, cast it to dogs. It's not me to cast it to dogs. <clears throat> you see, I think a reason why she was willing to take so much of that on the chin and allow that to happen is because she came out of the coasts. I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't just around the corner for her. It says she came out of the coasts, outside of the borders. She, came, she was a Canaanite. She came out of, out of the coasts. She had to go a journey. I believe there's some walking involved. She heard where Jesus was, I believe, and she had to go on a journey to find him. Yeah. Now, why didn't the man go? Where was the husband? Maybe he, he wasn't around. But it must have taken a lot for a woman to leave her, her grievously vexed daughter behind, who probably needed you know, care and attention to go and, and travel. I mean, this was the day before you know Uber wasn't around. You know, the camel didn't show up, and the phone go off and say your Uber is here. You know, she had to she had a journey. Yeah. <clears throat> And we're willing to endure much, you know. We're, when we put a lot on the line, we'll take a lot. You know, if we want something bad enough, it doesn't matter what comes at us because we, we were determined to get it. And I think that's really what it was about for this lady. She had a daughter which was grievously vexed with the devil. And she wanted that daughter healed more than anything. And it didn't matter how far she had to go or how people treated her or how much the Lord ignored her. She was going to get what she wanted. And it reminds me of the story of the, of the, the widow and the unjust judge. Who, you know, she just keeps imploring him to venture of her enemies, venture of her enemies, yeah. and he comes without ceasing night and day. And the judge eventually does it not because he has compassion on her, but because she continually come to her, comes to her, and it was just, she's just a bother to him. Yeah. And it's a teaching us that sometimes we just need to be persistent no matter what. Even if it means being, you know, degraded a little bit. Even if we have to take, it may, requires us to be humbled a little bit. If we really want something bad enough, you know, we'll allow, uh, we just, it's not going to matter what gets in our way. <clears throat> I mean, Paul had that mentality. Paul said, you know, all things that were gained in me, I counted lost for Christ. He said, none of those things, um, you know, yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. I mean, if we want something from God, it's not going to matter how, we, how we're treated. It's not going to matter what length we have to go to. 
So I think that this was a great example, a great opportunity for Jesus to show his disciples you know, their own, the, the problems with their own hearts, that they were elitist, that they had, uh, but they didn't have the compassion they should have had, and to show them, you know, what true humility looks like when this lady came and allowed herself to be treated in such a way. And of course, we know the story ends well. It says there in verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. <coughs> yeah. Be it under thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. <coughs> I mean, by the time she got home, I, I mean, that very hour, she went away knowing that when she got home, that daughter was, was healed. But you know what? She knew that's what was going to happen before she even set out. That's otherwise she wouldn't have gone there. That's why, I mean, she believed Jesus who he was, was who he was. Yeah. She believed his God. She said, oh, Lord, you know, son of David. Yeah. She called him by those names. She understood who it was that she was going to. She had great faith. And Jesus departed from thanks, th th verse 29, and came uh, nigh to the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having uh, with them those that were lame, blind, and dumb, maimed, and as many others, uh, were, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. And again, I know I touched on this last week, but I just want to again point this out in Scripture that so often we see other people bringing the, those that need healed to Jesus. You know, they're not they're not waiting for Jesus to come to them. Yeah. You know, that's again. I know I talked about this last I think Sunday night, where we have to be the ones that bring other people to Jesus. Yep. And we Amen. do that by going out and preaching the gospel. I'm not going to go on about that. But verse 31 it says, <clears throat> In so much that the multitude wondered, and when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue now with me three days and having nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. Now, what I like about this is that God here, He cares for every need. I mean, He just got done healing these people. The maim, or, I mean, maimed means like you lost something, like you're disfigured. Like if you got maimed in, a, in an accident, you know, you lost a toe or a foot or something. He makes these people whole. I mean, it's a miracle. Causes the blindness. He does all these great miracles. I mean, He, he gives them these great, you know, cares for the most dire physical needs that they have. And then He even cares about the fact that they're hungry. He says, you know what? I don't want them to faint in the way. I mean, couldn't they say, well, you know, you've, you've kind of done enough for them already, Jesus. I mean, they were blind, but now they can see. At least they can find their way to some food now. Right. But he's concerned about every single need. And that should be a great lesson to us. You know, that we should not, uh, you know, seek after the things that the Gentiles seek after. You know, we shouldn't worry about clue, uh, food and raiment for after these things that the Gentiles seek. Before our Heavenly Father knoweth what things we have need of before we even ask Him. You know, God already knows the things that we need and, and is, is willing to... Um, and, and more than capable of taking care of, of our needs. Yeah. You know, they could have, couldn't they stand to go out a meal after the healing that they just had? But he didn't want them to faint in the way, you know, and, and, he, and he takes care of even the, the most basic need. And it says there in verse 33, and it says, And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? Now, why in the world are they asking this? Yep. Remember last the chapter, the previous chapter? <laughs> he just got done doing this exact same miracle, yeah. and it's so soon they quick that they're so quick to forget. Yeah. And we'll see later where Jesus rebukes them and says, You know, don't you remember how many loaves took you up when I fed the five thousand? Yeah. How many loaves took you up when I fed the four thousand? Yeah. But it's it's one literally one chapter later and they're already, how are you gonna do it? Wow. I mean, how can you forget a miracle so powerful as that? <laughs> I don't this this gets me every time I read it. Like like, did I, I'm like, was I reading in a different, you know, I have to like go back, no, that was chapter 14. It was literally the last page where he's doing the exact same miracle, and a page later, they're already forgetting the thing that God can do. You know, and that's, that's human nature. That's the way we are. You know, we'll see God come through for us one instance and do a great work on our behalf. He'll work things out, some situation. And then the next time we find ourselves in another situation, we're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, I don't know God's going to, you know, is this even possible? And we totally forget about what God has done for us in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's, just, that's just human nature. <clears throat> and he goes on and says, And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. <coughs> And they that had eaten were 4,000 men, besides women and children, and he sent away the multitude and took ship and came to the coast of Magdala. Now what's interesting here is the numbers, specifically, when you compare the two feedings. In the first feeding, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, chapter 14, he feeds, um, or here, excuse me, in this chapter, he feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves and, it says, a few, or three fishes. 
So he actually has more, right? But he does less. And in the first chapter, he feeds 5,000 people with less loaves and less fish. Yep. So it just goes to show you that God, you know, he can do more with less. And that God can do abundantly more than we even ask or think. You know, that, that God is capable of taking care of every single need, even if what we would say, well, that's, that's uh, even less than we had last time. Which is, I thought was interesting, that God can take do more with even less. Why? Because he gets the glory for it. In the end, they'll say, well, that, you know, we know it was a miracle of God for sure because he even fed more people with less. Yeah. And God will strengthen our inner man you know, by asking of our outer man. And what do I mean by that? Think about this. That wasn't their fish. That wasn't their loaves. Somebody else had to give that up, right? And we see that if we were to go to John, you would see it was the little lad. They said there was a lad here who had seven loaves and uh, two fishes, or a few fishes. And that's what it says there. There is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes. So this guy has this little boy's lunch, you know, and uh, he gives it to God, and God does this great miracle. And I can imagine how moved that little boy must have seen see his lunch go to feed so many people and see this great miracle that Jesus did. But it cost him his lunch, didn't it? Now I'm sure he got some, right? I'm sure they might maybe they gave him one of the baskets. You know, he got a little with interest. I don't know. But he, he definitely got to partake in that meal. But it took a little bit of faith, didn't it? So sometimes God, you know, he'll strengthen our inner man, but it might it might cost us something. We might be able to see God move and do a great work. But it's gonna cost somebody something. There, there, you know, as the saying goes, there is no free lunch. Right. You know, everybody's sitting down and going, cool, free lunch. The little boy's like, no. Yeah. You know, that was my lunch, you know, <laughs> that you guys are eating. But um, you think about it, you know, if the lad had been selfish, you know, what if he said, no, I'm not going to give it to you guys, it's mine. Get your own. I'm three days out in the wilderness with you too. i got to get back. But he didn't do that. He had that, that little bit of faith to say, here, do what you will, what you will do. And he gave it to him. And, but if he had been selfish, he wouldn't have been part of that miracle. He wouldn't have been written down here in John chapter 6 where we see him taking that little bit that he had and giving it to God and letting him do a great miracle. And sometimes that's what we have to do. You know, if we're going to see God do a great work, it might cost us something. You know, and, and we should always make sure that, you know, the lad here, he wa I think he wanted to see this done, you know, for the sake of others. He was willing to give that up. I think a lot of times we want to see miracles happen for our own sake. You know, what, God, will you do this for me? You know, I think sometimes we need to pray and ask, you know, God, will you do this for so-and-so? I mean, we could get just as excited about somebody else, God working on, on behalf of somebody else as we could ourselves. At least we should. Mm -hmm. You know, some brother or sister comes to you and says, hey, will you pray about this with me? I don't know how this is going to work out. And you pray and ask God to do something on their behalf, and that happens. You get just as excited for that person as you would for yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what this lad got to experience when he gave up his lunch. You know, that was his lunch, and he got to see other people be filled with that lunch. So, you know, we should always be willing to, to, to give and to think of others. And really, that's kind of a theme that we see a little bit, you know, in tonight's sermon. You know, that it, we should be considerate of other people. You know, and not, you know, the woman of Canaan, you know, we shouldn't look down on others. And that we should be willing to, to help others. And we should be willing to give of ourselves and our own substance and ask God to work on behalf of others as well. But let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.